Hey guys, just got this battery in for review. This is a 12 volt, 105 amp hour, group 24 heated lithium iron phosphate battery from Epoch Batteries. I picked this up during their Black Friday sales event. It was 15% off and it shipped free and I felt that was a fantastic deal. Epoch Batteries has built themselves a solid reputation over the past few years. They are one of the few companies you practically never hear a single complaint about. It's been about two years since I've taken a look at any of their batteries, and since that time they've built a whole new line of batteries of new products, and I thought this would be a good place to start taking a look at some of them. We'll run through the usual review process here today, we'll take a look at the battery specifications, we'll run a capacity test, and then we'll tear it apart to see how it's built inside. This battery measures roughly 10 and a quarter inches in width, eight and a quarter inches in height and six and a half inches in depth, and it weighs in at 22 pounds. As already stated, it's a 105 amp hour battery that is 1.34 kilowatt hours. It has a maximum discharge rating of 100 amps continuous and a maximum peak discharge rating of 200 amps for up to 10 seconds. It can be charged up to 100 amps at a constant current and it does come with a very lengthy 11 year warranty. This battery is also self heated so it can be charged when the ambient temperature is below freezing and it includes Bluetooth support. Taking a look at the top of the battery, it's a very standard case. We have our collapsible plastic handles for carrying and we have some standard epoxied in M8 terminal studs. We have a model number, what I assume is a serial number and then a Mac address probably of the Bluetooth interface. Uh, the user's manual is online. I've printed out a copy here just to take a quick look at. Uh, the recommended charge is 50 amps and the recommended discharge is 80 amps. Uh, sticking to those numbers while it can do higher continuously, sticking to these numbers will help lengthen the lifespan of your battery. And the cycle life is rated for 4000 cycles at an 80% depth of discharge. Alright, so the battery charging has completed as per the usual. I use my Ames 12 volt lithium iron phosphate rated charger and the battery has sat on the charger overnight. Can go ahead and disconnect the charger now and we're ready to begin the capacity test. So we are discharging at 20 amps or a 0.2 C rate. That's approximately 275 watts at the current voltage. And our capacity test concluded at 112.04 amp hours. That is quite a bit higher than the rating of 105 amp hours. And taking a look at the discharge report, this test took five hours, 35 minutes, 11 seconds. As we said, 112.04 amp hours. We started at 14.41 volts and we ended at 10.69 volts. That cutoff voltage at 10.69 volts is a little bit higher than I would have expected for a lithium iron phosphate battery. So here's a quick look inside. It's very basic. We have our BMS and we have our cells. And this does appear to be a, a JBD or some variant of JBD BMS here. And taking a look at our cabling here, it does appear to be a pair of number eight silicone insulated wires. Two lugs on one end, one lug on the other end, and those go down to the C minus side of the BMS, the common charge and discharge port. Coming off that, we have another pair of number eights, which go from the B minus of the BMS down to the battery. That was pretty easy. There's the uh, bus bars of the battery pack here, and they actually have some epoxy board between the bus bars and the cells as an added level of insulation and protection. And I can see here how they actually have holes cut in that epoxy board where the terminals go. Uh, so the positive conductor here is a single number six silicone insulated wire. I see they do have a temperature sensor affixed to this epoxy board and I do have to wonder why that is not inside the battery pack, but perhaps they wanna get a measurement of the ambient temperature considering our heating pads are down in there. And then we have another sensor up here. This is going to be a high temperature sensor or a thermal switch. It's actually not a temperature sensor. It's not a thermistor. It's a thermal switch that's engineered to either make or break at a predefined temperature. In this case, it's rated for 60 degrees Celsius. And then the last thing I'm taking note of here is how the balance leads are affixed to the bus bars. They appear to be laser welded, perhaps aluminum tabs, or I guess it could be a nickel tab, some sort of non-aluminum material there, which the balance leads are then connected to. So this yellow, white, and blue are going to be balance leads. This red, I'm guessing, is also a balance lead, and then probably red positive power for the BMS, probably for that heating circuit. So the battery pack is built a little bit different than we typically see. It is four cells and they are held together with this plastic nylon strap. There's two straps here and here. We have epoxy board on all sides of this battery. Lastly, on both ends of the battery, we have a steel plate and it looks to be about an eighth of an inch thick if I had to guess, maybe a little thinner. And on this particular steel plate, we have a few standoffs that this BMS is mounted on. Uh, so this is actually built very well. It's not just slapped together with some tape around it like we see some of these batteries being built. 
All right, taking a look at the battery pack construction after I've broken off some of the epoxy board, uh, we'll start with the bottom. It does have a layer of fish paper or battery paper covering the bottom. The battery is held together with a lot of strapping tape. You can see some here. So you can tell that fixing this battery pack together was of a high priority to them. Additionally, by looking at this orientation, we can see that all the cells are perfectly straight. There's no bloating. They fit together absolutely perfectly. They are pristine, brand new cells. Taking a closer look at cells one and two and three and four, well, all of the cells have this fish paper separator between them. So you can see two layers here, one layer here, and two layers here. So on cells one and two and three and four, we're going to have two layers because between those is the heater pad. One other thing to note about the top of this battery is they are using a PCB approach. While they do have individual balance leads to the terminals, those balance leads come back to the PCB, then they're routed up to a central point here on the left, where there's just a small jumper connector from this PCB over to the BMS. This is a genuine Eve cell. It starts with 04Q. It is a 105 amp hour cell and it says 336 watt hours. There's no scratching or manipulation or anything that looks like this code might've been messed with. It does not surprise me in the slightest because like I said, this is a highly reputable company and I do believe they work directly with Eve or, or Roy Pow, which is part of Eve. So I expect nothing less than a perfect, pristine, brand new cell in this battery. All right. I, I am fairly certain this is a JBD BMS, but I cannot get any visual confirmation of that. I did manage to scratch enough of this adhesive off to see this sticker. It's written in Chinese. I do see 100 amps on there, so I know it's 100 amp rated. On the side here, we have part number DP04S007 version 1.7. One thing that is a little surprising is JBD BMSs typically have two temperature sensors and this only has one temperature sensor connected. Additionally, the Bluetooth module is actually built into the BMS. It's not a separate module. So here is the Bluetooth antenna on the side here. So it's nice to see they're finally incorporating that into the BMS instead of having dongles and modules floating around. So now we are charging the battery at 9.7 amps. We can see that reflected on the bench power supply and we can see that on our clamp meter. They are disagreeing a little bit, but it's just because of the accuracy of the clamp meter. So what I'm gonna do is spray some of this computer duster on the temperature sensor and we should see this stop charging. We should see the clamp meter stop charging but I assume this will continue, this power supply will continue providing power for that uh, heating system until it's considered warm enough for this battery to begin charging again. Okay, so two seconds, we see our current drop to 6.9 amps. So we know that heater is on, but I'm expecting that to see that actually shut off completely. Let's try that again here. Okay, so now the charging has stopped, but we're still taking 3.4 amps out of this power supply. So that power there is going to be what those heaters are consuming. As soon as that temperature sensor we sprayed warms back up, we should see this begin charging again. So let me try to warm that up artificially here. And there we go, we began charging again at 6.9 amps, so we know that heater is still on. It may need a little bit more warmth here. And we're back to 10 amps, so the heater has now shut off. So let's try that one more time just to be sure. The heater's on. And charging has shut off. This works and functions perfectly. Taking a look at the phone app here, the first thing you'll need to do is select your battery. So I'll click on. And then on the bottom here, I can click the dashboard button and I can see the information about my battery. It is at 0% state of charge. 11.9 volts and it says there is one out of 105 amp hours remaining. Uh, there is a setting here to toggle between parallel and series. I assume it'll just change some of the statistics. I don't have a second battery to test with. And down here we can see it has two cycles and again it's at 0%. Uh, taking a look at the cells tab. The average voltage is 3.0. The differential is zero voltage. The low is 2.9 and the high is 3.0. Now I do have to wonder why voltage differential is not showing 0.1. I assume it's just a rounding thing. Taking a look down a little further, we can see the voltage of all four cells in three digit precision. Our single temperature sensor is at 67.8 degrees Fahrenheit. And then we have status and on off toggle switches for the charging and discharging. Going to the about tab, we have some information about the company here. Uh, their telephone number, their address, all of the support information you need from your battery is right here. This sort of contact information is not typically something we see in these apps and it is very nice to see. Now there is an advanced setting here, but it does prompt for a pin and I couldn't find what that pin was anywhere online. So I assume that is just for uh, epochs use. Uh, but since this is a JBD BMS, we should be able to see it with some of the usual apps. 
And now the Overkill Solar app can see the battery. Let's go ahead and open it. And there we can see all of the technical information about our battery from the Overkill Solar app. We can go down to the settings. I haven't tried actually changing a setting in here, but I certainly do not recommend you be tinkering with these settings. The BMS is configured to begin balancing at 3.45 volts when there's a voltage differential of 10 millivolts or greater. The protection parameters are perhaps the most interesting. Over temperature is 55 degrees Celsius, under temperature is 0 degrees Celsius. Battery over voltage is 14.7, under voltage is 10.8. Uh, so there is why our discharge capacity test shut down so earlier, or what I felt was early at least, because it's configured for 10.8 volts. That's interesting. And the low cutoff per cell is 2.5 volts. So unless your cells are really out of balance, you're probably never going to see this cell under voltage be hit. It's always going to shut off with the battery voltage below 10.8 volts. And I don't see anything in here related to the heating circuit. This is not the appropriate app for this BMS. Uh, I am simply using it because I wanted to pull back these settings and see what they are programmed for. So there we go, the 12 volt, 105 amp hour, group 24 heated lithium iron phosphate battery from Epoch Batteries. I don't think there's a single thing they can do to improve on this battery. It seems to be a quality solid design. It blew the capacity test out of the water with 112 amp hours. Everything is laid out nicely. It's cabled nicely. It's got a very nice fixture with steel plates on the end. And one thing I haven't mentioned yet is the manufacturer does say you can wire four of these in series for a 48 volt system. Now, typically I do not recommend wiring heated batteries in series because those heaters are not going to turn on and off at the same time. They're not synchronized, they don't communicate. To my knowledge, I haven't seen anything in the manual or on their website that suggests these have some sort of communication between the four batteries if you wire them in series. So I, I personally would not wire them in series. I would go out and find a 48 volt heated battery. Now, Epoch does have a new rack mount battery coming out that's 48 volts and is self-heated. That said, this is probably one of the best 12 volt, 100 amp hour batteries for somewhat outdoor use, whether that be for a trolling motor, for fishing boats, RVs. I see a lot of people installing batteries in the cargo bay of RVs and that's not a conditioned space. So if you're going through colder climates, you may want you may want a heated battery for that space. Now these do carry a slightly higher price compared to some of the other LFP batteries we've looked at. This one sells for $349 when it's not on sale. Really what it comes down to is you get what you pay for. Please let me know what you guys think. If you have one, if you're looking to buy one, if there's anything you think I missed, Hit that like button before you go, and thanks for watching.